As many of you know, on Wednesday evenings, Brother Jim's been teaching through the book of Matthew here in the sanctuary, and I've been over uh, having the privilege of ministering to our young people. And a few weeks ago, we started a series over there. Well, actually, we started two or three series and hadn't got through them. We're kind of bouncing around a little bit. But we started a series entitled Band of Brothers and Sisters in Christ. And for the last two weeks, we've been on that series. And I feel kind of impressed to talk to you guys about that same topic. Um, you might say, well, whatever happened to the book of Proverbs you were going through? I hadn't forgotten Proverbs either. But we're going to probably be stretching Proverbs into 2023, uh, as well as maybe December. But for the month of November, we're going to be looking at the subject, Band of Brothers and Sisters in Christ. So uh, this is part one in what will probably be a four-part series. And if any of you young people think, well, I can skip out on Wednesdays because I'm going to hear it again on Sundays, don't do that. Because there are different, different things that will come out when you talk to uh, the whole church body as opposed to our middle and high schoolers. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at a few scriptures this morning, but... This is a very important subject for us to look at as a church. You see, I feel like my responsibility as pastor is to use the Word of God to give you a biblical mindset on how the church should, should function and operate as a body of Christ. Uh, and it's so important as we dive into this for you to understand those of you that are born-again believers, those of you that have united with an expression of the body of Christ, which is the local church, uh, we can look at ourselves as a band of brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you remember uh, hearing from time to time, maybe the first time you ever experienced that you come to church and hear somebody say, well, Brother Jim, or... Our sister, uh, Betty, you know, sometimes we refer to one another as brothers and sisters. And you know, what is that all about? But uh, that's what we're going to get into that to today somewhat. If, if you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just a brief overview of the chapter, he starts off talking about spiritual gifts. And as he talks about spiritual gifts in verses 1 uh, through 11, then he starts talking about the body, the actual body of Christ. And he compares the body of Christ to a physical body. And that's what we're going we're gonna to start. And we're going to read some. And then he, he closes with talking about spiritual uh, gifts as well. But we're going to begin in uh, chapter 12, verse 12. He says, For as the body is one, speaking again of the physical body, and hath many members... And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So, you know, I have one body, but I have hands. I have feet, legs attached, right? Eyes, ears, big mouth, okay? Our, our one body is made up of many members. And then he says... For by one Spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, are we all, and they want to circle that, as a church, he's talking to believers, we're all baptized into one body. He's talking about the body of Christ. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But notice verse 18, but now God hath set the members, 
every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomeliness parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism, or we could say division, in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Now as he talks about these members and needs and so forth, it is sandwiched right in between him talking about spiritual gifts. And each member, each believer in the body of Christ has been given at least one spiritual gift to serve God through the local church. But what part we want to speak on today is just talking about this whole idea of being uh, one body in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the privilege of us being able to have our own copies of it and to be able to read it ourselves and, and to gather to hear it taught and preached. We ask, Lord, that you meet with us today and we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. So whether you realize it or not, when you were saved, you were baptized into what we would refer to as the body of Christ. We touched on this, I believe, some last week. And some refer to this as the universal church. But you see, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not just some invisible body out there floating around. The body of Christ is manifest, is shown through the local church. We happen to be in uh, Naola, uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church of Naola. That speaks of the area our church is in. You know, there, there are many churches in various places here in Virginia. We, I, I want to say we're blessed with that, but sometimes that doesn't work too much as a blessing because people sometimes go from one to another to another for really not a biblical reason. But we are established here, been established as a church, we think, since about 19, not 19, 1847. So just celebrating our 175th anniversary as a church. I haven't been there about that long myself. Um, <laughs> I guess any of us have, but um, it's important to know we're among other churches, other local churches, and we all make up the body of Christ. When did we become a part of the body of Christ? When we were baptized by the Holy Spirit at salvation. Okay, We were immersed in Christ. We became part of the body. And as I said, believers decide what local church they're going to be a part of in an area like we have with many various churches. Some places aren't uh, as populated with churches as, as we are around here. Uh, it's not as much out here as it is if you start getting into Madison Heights and Lynchburg. But um, once you become a part of a local church, which is, again, a manifestation of the body of Christ, how do we function? How do we relate to one another? And that's kind of the, the thrust of this series. You see, as followers of Christ, our identity is wrapped up in Christ. As you read through the various New Testament epistles, especially the book of Ephesians, you keep seeing this phrase repeated over and over, in Christ. And you were placed positionally in the Lord Jesus Christ at the moment of salvation. You might say, well, where does baptism, water baptism, come into all of this? Well, we said at salvation, someone is immersed into Christ through the Holy Spirit. But then they publicly identify with Christ through believer's baptism. And we spent the whole service talking about that last week. You see, this focus of this, this particular uh, series, when we talk about band of brothers, 
of brothers and sisters in Christ is going to be more focusing upon how we really truly should be with one another, not how most churches do it. Okay? We're going to look at Scripture and we're going to look at some truths from Scripture and say, are we being biblical in our gathering? Okay? You know, in Scripture there are many one another's in the in the New Testament. A whole lot of one another's. And we're going to look at uh, a couple of those today. But just to give you an idea, in Romans 12, 10, where it says preferring one another. What does that mean? That means giving preference, preference or putting others first. But you know, that sometimes goes right against our grain, doesn't it? Galatians 5.13 says we're to serve one another. Galatians 2.6.2 2 says that we are to bear one another's burdens. That word bear, bear means carry with endurance. And the burdens he's speaking of is heavy loads that are difficult to lift and carry. We're to bear one another's burdens. Ephesians 4.32 tells us two things. Be kind to one another. Be forgiving one another. Colossians 3, 9. Not to lie to one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Edify one another. Build up one another. That's what he's talking about. Hebrews 10, 24. We're to consider one another to provoke to love and good works. Hebrews 10.25, again, he talks about exhorting one another, encouraging one another. James 5.10, he says, pray for one another. 1 Peter 3.8, have compassion for one another. These one another's in Scripture are so, so important to how we function or supposed to function as a local church. So the one we're going to focus in on today is probably the foundational one, in my mind, of the one another's, and that's in Gospel of John, chapter 13. We've been teaching in our Sunday school class through the Gospel of John. Today we covered chapter 14, last week chapter 13, and these are some of the, the most rich chapters in Scripture. I think all of it's good, but when I look at things that really stand out to me, I'm looking at the things that were within the last 24 hours of our Savior's life here on earth before he faced Calvary. And what's taking place here in John chapter 13 is important. If you remember, by way of review, they're there in the upper room. Jesus washes the disciples' feet giving us an example of how we should serve one another. Jesus says some things that are troubling to the disciples. He says, one of you is going to betray me. Then he goes on to say that I'm going away, and where I'm going, you can't come now. Then he, he foretells of Peter denying him three times. That's all a good reason that chapter 14 opens up with Jesus saying, let not your heart be troubled. But here in John 13, among all of that, I want to start in verse 33. As Jesus talks about his leaving. He says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Now he spent three years these guys. They've invested their lives in his ministry. They've left family. They've left their vocations. And they followed him. Looking that he would one day establish an earthly rule. That wasn't Jesus' direction. He says, little children, yet a little while I'm with you, and ye shall seek me as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. And in view of that, here's what he says in verse 34. 
So now I say unto you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this, you could circle the by this and then draw a line up in verse 34 to that word love. By this, love shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. You see, in Matthew 22, Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment of all the commandments? And we've said before, the Jews identified about 615 commandments, a lot of commandments. Jesus, though, is asked, what's the greatest one? And he said, to love God with your total being. Love God with your, your whole heart. Your heart, your mind, your total being. And then he said, the second is like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? You with me so far? So, Jesus has already taught you to love your neighbor as yourself. We've said here at Cornerstone, our neighbor is the person that's beside us at the time. Good definition of a neighbor. It's not necessarily talking about your next door neighbor, although that would qualify as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. So here in the upper room, less than 24 hours before Jesus would die on the cross, he says to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you. And it's similar to the one he's already given them about loving one another. That was from God's word in the Old Testament. But now he's saying, you love one another as I have loved you. By saying that, Jesus took that love to a whole different level than what it had been before. How had it been before? Well, it had been that I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. A lot of people today want to twist that around and say, so you need to be working on loving yourself. But many times we already love ourselves. Sometimes that's too much of a problem. But here Jesus is saying, you know, instead of love your neighbor as yourself, he's saying love as I've loved. You know, God's word tells us that our love should be, well, Jesus loved, greater man hath no love than this and to lay down his life for his friend. That's quite a love. Less than 24 hours, Jesus is going to be modeling that love. He's going to the cross. Remember, for God so loved the world that he gave. The cross was a manifestation of God's love for you and I. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Jesus didn't say they will know you're my disciple because you gather together, although that's very important. He didn't say that they will know you're my disciple because you carry a, a scroll of the scriptures around, or for us in the day and time we live in, a Bible. He didn't say they will know you are my disciples because you carry the name Christian. He said, they will know you are Christians. You're my disciples by your love for one another. Your ID badge as my disciple is how you love one another. Hmm. You know how comes one reason we have so many churches in the area? Some of those churches come because Christians can't get along. Christians nitpick and fight, and before you know it, you have a, a church split. If you really study Scripture, you can find us some reasons you should definitely um, part company. But a lot of times the reasons are not the biblical ones. Here, though, Jesus gives us a challenge today as we're gathered here at Cornerstone. He's saying that I'm to love you and you're to love me as he loved. Wow. What a challenge. 
As I said, he took this love to a whole different level. The disciples, as he left, would be bound to one another by mutual love. So we would be brothers and sisters, a band of brothers and sisters in Christ, bound together by mutual love, and that love should be as Christ loved us. As Jesus leaves, these disciples would now be bound by that love for each other. Now think about this for a moment. The disciples. What a group. Okay? But I'm going to just pick two to give you uh, something to think about. Matthew, tax collector for Rome. A Jewish tax collector for Rome. He wasn't exactly the popular guy among his people. Why? Because it could be looked at as an, as an act of betrayal to be gathering taxes for the Romans from your own people. Hmm. Simon. Not Simon Peter, but Simon. We don't know a lot about Simon, but we know Simon was a zealot. The zealots were a political party at that time that really wanted to overthrow Roman rule over the Jews. And they would use violence to do it. Okay? So here you get the Jewish tax collector that's collecting taxes for Rome and someone that's adamant opposed to Rome. A freedom fighter, we could think. Someone that had a hatred and their goal is to overthrow Roman occupation and they would have refused to pay taxes. And these guys are sitting together now. They've been with Jesus three years. How do you think that matchup went? <laughs> Talking about awkwardness at a, hot, at a family gathering or something. Here they are sitting there. Okay. Here you've got Peter, very outspoken of the group many times seeming to put his foot in his mouth. You have James and John, who you don't hear too much out of, but they're known as the sons of thunder. They may have been pretty opinionated themselves at times. Jesus brought these disciples from various groups and occupations and ways of life together. Jesus gave them a new kind of identifying sign Mutual love for one another. Now, many of you have went into a place of employment. If you hadn't experienced this yourself, you've been a part of it personally or know of this. Get your little ID badge, right? We wear a little ID badges at Vacation Bible School that tell us, Hi, my name is Pastor Payton, right? That's our ID badge. Well, your ID badge, my ID badge as a believer, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is the love we're supposed to have for one another. That's tremendous. So as a band of brothers and sisters in Christ, that love should be very mutual and very real. You see, Christ's love, what did that look like? It brought him from heaven's glory to this earth. It brought him from his position at the right hand of the Father to the position of a servant. It brought him from, to an excruciating death on the cross. And then he leaves us with this identifying sign. So for you and I, what does that love look like? What are some concrete examples of that love that we're supposed to have. You see, you go to 1 Corinthians 13. Just go back to chapter 12 and then 13 follows. He lays out what Christ's love looks like. The word that's used is agape. Agape love is used here and it's laid out in characteristics are given to explain it. The word in the, the King James is charity. But that is a, that word can be translated love. Agape love. Just a quick once over of it. He says in verse 4, 
that this type of love should suffer long. What does that mean? It should be patient and long-suffering? Ask yourselves, are you patient and long-suffering with your brothers and sisters in Christ? That type of love, because it's long-suffering, endures evil, injury, and being provoked. Also says that love is kind. That means it's good-natured, it's gentle, it's tender and courteous. You know, we need to think about how we speak to one another. Do we speak with kindness to one another? Then it says, love envieth not. That means it's not jealous. It's not greed when something good happens to someone else. Real love is going to be happy when something good happens to someone else. He goes on, love vaunteth not itself. It means it does not brag or parade itself about. It subdues pride and vainglory. It says love is not puffed up. It's not arrogant or inflated with pride. This love, in verse 5, do, doth not behave itself unseemly. What does that mean? This type of love does not act unbecoming. What does that mean? It's not rude. It's not rude. It does not pass the bounds of decency. This love seeketh not her own, meaning it's not selfish. It's not wanting to have its own way. It's others minded. It says it also there in verse 5, love is not easily provoked. It's not easily exasperated or aroused to anger. It guards against being irritated, upset, angered by things that are said or done. It doesn't think evil. That's a bookkeeping term actually is used there. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. In other words, it keeps no record of wrongs. As I said, it's a bookkeeping term that means to calculate or reckon as when figuring an entry in a ledger, the purpose of the entry is to make a permanent record that can be consulted whenever needed. Real love doesn't go back and look at that record and say, oh, but six months ago you did this to me. Or last week you did that to me. No, it does not rejoice in iniquity it thinketh no evil. It's not suspicious. Does not give way to vengeance. And it forgives. Then verse 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Does not delight in evil. Takes no pleasure in sin. Will not rejoice when others fail. This type of love rejoices in truth. Has a satisfaction to see truth and justice prevail. Rejoices when truth is defended and advanced. Verse 7, love beareth all things. Love will put up with being hurt. Love will hide or conceal the faults and imperfections of others. Love beareth all things. It's apt to believe well of all and to entertain a good opinion of others when there's no appearance to the contrary. Love hopeth all things. It refuses to take failures as final. Love endureth all things. It talks about remaining steadfast and persevering. And love never fails. It means it remains strong through testing. You know, 43% of those characteristics of love, 7 out of 16, deal with responding to adversity. Think about it. How many times do Christians fail at this among themselves? It's easy to do. It's easy to get upset at somebody at church and stop coming because you're upset at somebody. Somebody hurt your feelings or, or, or hurt you deeply. 
And instead of, as we're going to learn in this series, dealing with it the way God wants us to deal with it that helps us grow in Christ's likeness, we take off. I, there are people sometimes that will look you in the face in the church and say, I love you. And then you do the least little thing to bother them and they're gone. That's not love. That's not love. Love is interacting with one another as a body, as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not once the, the amen is said at the end of the service, always just taking off and not interacting with others. In drawing this thing to a close, I want to give you one other passage today. Go to Hebrews 10. It's one you're very familiar with. Hebrews 10. I want you to see two one another's there. I'll not expound on those as I have love. <coughs> but I want you to see them. It's easy for our mindset to be skewed about church. Because we may just say, well, we've always done it like that. Okay? Or no other churches do it this way. What we have to ask ourselves is what we're hearing biblical. And if it is, we adapt it to our, our mindset. Notice in Hebrews 10, this is the passage we use many times to help people understand they are responsible before God to come to church. Notice he says in verse 24, that's our first one another. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Notice verse 12, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That's the second one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now we believe this day approaching to be the day of Christ's return. And as we've said before, we don't know when his return is, but it's closer today than it was last week. Okay? Now, let's break this down and make it really, really applicable. What stands out here is we're not to forsake a singing together. But if we don't consider the context and the things that are around this, we could miss it. Many people's mindset is we come to church and worshiping God is about listening to His Word and maybe being encouraged by His Word or challenged. And then and, you know, through the music, we, we worship God. Um, we give to uh, help the church survive and get along. Uh, that, that kind of mindset. And we just kind of watch. That's totally unbiblical. But so many people gravitate to that. You see, I don't even like to refer to church as a church service. We use that phrase a lot, but it's a gathering of the body of Christ. It's a family get-together. It's what it is. Okay? And... Notice here what he says. Yes, he says, don't forsake assembling together. Someone would say, well, I don't have to come to church to be a Christian. No, you don't. But you have to come to church to be an obedient Christian. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Look at verse 24. Let us consider one another. It didn't say let the preacher consider how we're doing it didn't say, let the deacons visit us. It said, believers, let us consider one another. For what? To provoke. That word means to stir up. To stir up one another to love and good works. That's what we're to be doing in yeah. Yes, singing is part of worship. Yes, giving is a part of worship. 
Yes, the preaching and teaching of God's Word is a part of worship and so important, but there's an element that we miss if we're not careful. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, a band of brothers and sisters in this local church, and we are to come together to consider one another and stir one another up to love and to good works. Then he goes on after he talks about not forsaking assembling together. He says, but exhorting. That means encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. How many of you have ever come to church and just needed a lift? Needed a little extra encouragement? We all do. But the, the good thing about what you're hearing today is that we come not just to get that, but to give it. To give it. So you are important. When you're not here, you're missed. But it's not just because we have an open pew or we don't have a big attendance. It's part of a body that's supposed to be here for one another. And as far as spiritual gifts go, you ever been seated and all of a sudden you're supposed to get up and your legs gone to sleep? Oh my, I'm going to have to walk. I may do a face plant. You know, but your legs sleep. Your members aren't working right. In a sense, they're, since they're asleep, they're kind of gone temporarily. You see, with this church and the ministry needs of this church and what God wants this church to do in Amherst County or in the Monroe area, God has provided for this church, I truly believe, everything we need. But that don't mean all the bases are covered. Why? Because if we don't understand we are to love as Christ loved among ourselves and we're to function as a local church body based upon how he wants us to function, we miss it. Let's bow our heads.